first Wednesday. It's my first Wednesday. It's my first any day to be in this house. Man, what an honor, what an honor. Why don't you say hi to your neighbor and get on back to your seat if you can. I wanna leave as much time for the Lord as possible. How about that worship? Come on. I believe God is always worthy of our worship. Sometimes it's just a little easier to give it to him when the music's good. And the music was so, so good tonight. Thank you, Ben. Hey, don't go far, don't go far, don't go far. I'm gonna want you again. Real quickly, listen to me. I believe that the, that the scriptures are very clear about a lot of things. And one of the things I think my generation in particularly is not doing a great job at is doing something the Bible calls showing honor. And so tonight, before we jump into the word of God, if you love the angels of the Lord of this house, come on, if you love your pastors, I need you to jump on your feet, put your hands together. Come on, if you love Pastor Brad, if you love Pastor Denise, come on, get on your feet. Come on. You did not take much coercing. They love you. So, so honored. Come on, if you love Pastor Nick, give it up for Pastor Nick. So thankful, so thankful. Pastor Carlos, is you, are you in the house? Come on, we got Pastor Carlos. Come on. Man. The church is doing incredible things and I'm just so, so thankful for what the Lord has done thus far in this region, man, we were, I've got to meet everybody today and just within the last few hours. And it's really uncanny how wild um, our stories are interwoven. My personal story with the Lord, my journey with the Lord, and this house's and the leadership's journey with the Lord. Uh, we come from very similar heritage of faith. And so many uh, of us were marked by the same men and women of God. And it's, it's just like God to weave our stories together in a way none of us had to force it. And I'm just so excited. Again, as has already been said, my name is Keenan Clark. I came all the way today from Franklin, Tennessee, right outside of Nashville. And uh, come on somebody, God's country. I love Tennessee and um, just so, so thankful. I, I'm, I'm from Texas, born and raised. I love, I love Texas. Uh, you'll never be able to take the Texas out of me. Um, normally I travel everywhere with my wife and my son. Um, my wife and son are back at home right now uh, just due to the season that we've kind of been in with some of my son's health issues. Uh, we've discerned that the Lord was saying they needed to stay back, keep him on the protocol that we have him on, the regiment that we have him on. But we did not want the devil to be able to keep the message from going forward. So I honor my wife. She is back home holding it down on the home front. And I'm excited to give the devil a bad time tonight. And real, real quickly, my grandmother's best friend is in the house. Linnell, I wanna say hi to you. So glad you're here. Come on, you brought some of your family. I wanna make sure I said hi to you. Don't leave till we get to hug and take a picture. Uh, my grandma, uh, man, just thankful for a heritage of faith, I would not be, forget preaching, I wouldn't know the Lord <laughs> like I know him. Preaching's just the cherry on top. If I never got to preach another day in my life, I'd be satisfied because knowing him is what it's all about. And I'm so thankful for a family that has fought to honor the Lord and to pass a heritage of faith on even though it seems like the generation today doesn't want it. There are those of us that still burn. There are those of us that are hungry. There are those of us that are good soil. And I'm thankful for my grandmother, my grandpa, my mom, my dad, a whole church helped raise me. And I didn't mean to get emotional, but I am very excited to preach tonight. And if you have a Bible, with no further ado, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter two. Look at one verse of scripture and it's verse 15. Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse 15. Some of you seasoned saints are like, where is this young man going? Song of Solomon? <laughs> oh, be quiet, it's okay. Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse 15. 
one of the less erotic verses in the book, <laughs> says this, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grape vines are blossoming. Catch all the foxes, those little foxes, Solomon says. You have to understand this about Solomon. Solomon is the wisest man who ever walked this planet outside of Jesus himself. Wisest man to ever suck oxygen on this little blue ball writes in his infinite wisdom the verse we read just a moment ago. Catch all the foxes, those little foxes. Tonight, if you're taking notes in the house of God, I want you to call this message, catch that fox. Catch that fox. We're gonna pray, and then I'm gonna dismiss you guys. Cool? Thank you. Father, I just thank you for the next couple moments we are going to share coming around your word, coming around your book. Lord, I pray that you would put me on like a glove and go to work. Lord, I pray for a heart in here that is fervently chasing you. Lord, I pray that they would find more fervor tonight. But Lord, I thank you for a heart of stone that wandered in here, was coerced in here, was told they'd be grounded if they didn't come in here. Lord, I pray for that heart. Lord, may you take that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that each and every single one of us would leave burning for the things of God tonight, more so than we were when we walked in. And it is in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, come on. Amen, amen. Come on, can we give it up for the team one more time? Again, don't go far. Y'all feel free to shout me down tonight. I am a hollerback preacher. I preach better and shorter. You were too excited about that. Better and shorter, the louder you get. Uh, but real quickly, I wanted to take you back into a moment in my life. I will never forget, it was a little over 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, I actually lived in this neck of the woods, okay? I hinted at it a moment ago, but I was a student at one point at a Bible school called Christ for the Nations, okay? <laughs> CFNI. I love the hand clap. I say that some places like, huh? Okay. Sometimes it was Christ or the nations, depending on if the F in the building like lit up. It was, you must choose, you know, Christ or the nations. But that's where I went, Christ for the nations. And uh, I remember one day while I was at Bible school, a little over 10 years ago, I was doing one of my absolute favorite things to do while here in Dallas, Texas. And I was at North Park Mall. Okay, I was at North Park Mall. And I was at my favorite store at North North Park Mall, and I was at my favorite section in my favorite store. And my favorite section of any store is a little section called clearance, okay? Anybody got that clearance oil on your life? Anybody know anything about that clearance anointing? You know what I mean? Sometimes, somehow, what you need is there when you need it. Come on, somebody. So I'm in the clearance section like any Christ for the Nation student would be, and I'm there rummaging through what's left, and I find this shirt, and it is the sickest shirt. It is a black shirt, and it's got these black little like designs on it, little details, decals on the shirt, black on black, couldn't quite tell what they were, but it's super sick, and it was 10 bucks, okay? So I took the shirt off, slap it on the counter, give the lady a $10 bill, and I walk out of there like I owned the place, okay? The next day, I went to... Christ for the nations. And I was like, I am wearing my new shirt. Okay. So I put my new shirt on. And the first thing we did at CFNI back in the day was we had chapel. All right. So I go to the chapel service. I'm up there in the IB. That's the main auditorium. And I am just, listen to me. I am worshiping God like there is no tomorrow, which is how you ought to worship, right? I am giving God a biblical worship. This is a literal sacrifice of praise. Okay. I am giving to God my whole body is getting involved. I think a daddy God slipped out of my mouth at one point, okay? That's how into it, that's how into it I was, okay? My RA later rebuked me for that. He's sitting right over here, actually. We don't say that around here, slugger. I am into it, okay? I'm into the worship, and you know, later on, after that was over, I went to one of my theology classes. I go to one of my theology classes, and I'm writing down the heavy revies, you know, the, the, the heavy revelations that the professor is spilling before us, all the while wearing my new 
Sure, okay. Later that day, my mom and dad had arranged a visit to come and meet with me. Okay, my mom and dad, I'm from San Angelo, Texas, support four hours from Christ for the Nations. So they make the long trek on in. They, they miss me. We have a pre-decided location and I show up to the location in my new shirt. I walk up to my pastor dad. You have to understand, my dad's a pastor. I come by this honestly, okay? Had God not called me into the ministry, I would have just volunteered, all right? This is, this is the only life I know, right? And so I walk up to my dad with all the CFNI swagger I had at the time, and he takes one look at me and does this, like up and down, and I, he said, son, uh, is that a new shirt? I said, yes, it is, dad. And my dad, well, well, to his face, we call him frugal. Behind his back, we tell it like it is, he's cheap, okay? The man's cheap, cheapskate, all right? And so my, to my dad, I was like bragging, I was like, dad, it was on clearance, okay? It was like $10. And he said, that's great. He said, have you, um, have you looked at it? I said, dad, of, of, of course I've looked at it. Like, what are you trying to say? He said, son, um, I hate to break it to you, but there are marijuana leaves <laughs> all over your shirt. I said, what? And sure enough, the man was not lying. The little designs, decals, details, black on black, I couldn't tell what they were. Yeah, it's hemp, okay? It's, it's cannabis on my shirt. I was walking around my campus repping cannabis, okay? I'm pretty sure they can revoke your salvation at Christ for the Nations for that. All right, that's a joke. But all of a sudden I realized I had gone to chapel in my marijuana shirt, just worshiping God, full out, in a marijuana shirt. I had gone to my theology classes in a marijuana shirt. My, my professor's like, dude, you got saved yesterday, didn't you, son? I'm like, how could you tell? <laughs> I had confidently dapped my pastor dad up in a marijuana shirt. You see, this is what I'm trying to get you to see here. I didn't realize what I had bought into, let alone what I was actively walking in because the details were so small. 400 little marijuana leaves slid right <laughs> under my, I thought they were a palm tree, dad. You know, it's like, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. You know, I'm like pulling scripture. But it slid, listen, it's, listen, it slid right under my radar because they were so small. I bought into something and was walking in something I did not agree with, did not want to propagate, did not want to preach, but I found myself in it because the details slid under my radar. And listen to me, I tell you that ridiculous story tonight because I think it illustrates the point Solomon is trying to make here in, sec in Song of Solomon's chapter two and verse 15. He says, catch all the foxes, those little foxes. Solomon's saying, hey, it's not just the big bad wolves that you gotta watch out for. It's these little foxes that are after you. Listen to me, I am about as churchy as they come. I got tattoos so I look like I have a testimony. <laughs> it's a true story. I was, at, I was working out the other day and my instructor was like, I bet you have a wild testimony. I was like, wait till you hear it. <laughs> I was born in the church and never left. But what I'm trying to get you to see is this. Uh, listen to me, I, like I come by this honestly. I have been in this thing a long time and I have been at times in my life really good at fending off big wolves while secretly petting little foxes. Little foxes are, are those places where you would be tempted to say, well, where does the Bible say? Like show me where the Bible says I can't engage with this. Like, give me a scripture where Paul condemns this. Give me, and then we, and then we give you one. <laughs> then we give you one. And you go, oh, well, show me where Jesus condemns it. <laughs> Gotta love those guys. Because the Bible tells you to. <laughs> 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 
show me where it says. Listen to me, little foxes are these places we are tempted to tolerate because in regards to what the rest of the world is doing, it's not really that bad. And Solomon, listen to me out of his infinite wisdom. I love it. And we could trust it because it's Bible. But I love that we can really, 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 really trust it because it's not just Bible, it's also Solomon. It's not just like this one dude who got a lot of things wrong and then all of a sudden the spirit of God alighted his mind and he wrote one good thing and it made it in the book. Like Solomon said a lot of really good things that never made it in the Bible. He was that wise. And Solomon says, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love. And here's, here's what I want to point, point out to you. I was reading this verse the other day and all of a sudden this jumped off the page to me. Notice what the foxes are after. They're after the vineyard. For the grape vines are blossoming. All of a sudden I was reading this the other day and vineyard and grape vines jumped off the page to me. And all of a sudden I remembered the words of Jesus in John 15. When Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. All of a sudden, if we allow a little hermeneutic to interpret scripture, we see that not only is Solomon getting this wisdom from the Holy Spirit, but it's because the Holy Spirit knew who would actually be the vine and what those little foxes are actually after. Listen to me tonight. Little foxes aren't just out to make you a compromising, cussing Christian. That's not their end goal. They're not just out you to get to vape every once in a while. That's not what they want. They ultimately want you to throw this whole Christian thing away. Like we are seeing this. I heard an eerie statistic recently that since the year 2000, 30 million Christians have left the faith. 24 years, 30 million. Professed the name of Christ at one point and have deconstructed their faith and no longer walk in it. That's what these little foxes are doing. Listen to me, can I, put you, can I just say what this is? This is coming into church, but then tolerating these little doubts and saying, hey, as long as I raise my hands and I show up on time and I look the part, I can have these little like curiosities. I can watch these little TikTokers, YouTubers, watch these little interesting things that actually challenge the very truth. My pastor's preaching to me and I'm reading in this book, but it's okay because it's just a little fox. These little foxes, listen to me, they are eating you alive. I, I've never met a person who came to the altar and simultaneously said, you know what? I'm doing this now, but like five years from now, when it gets old, I'm going to throw the whole thing away. No one plans on throwing away their faith, but you stick around this thing long enough, you will meet people and God forbid even become one yourself. Who does? The little foxes. Listen to me. They're after what you believe about Jesus. Now, if you are a thinking person, if you're like half educated, there's no way the enemy can come up to you and say, hey, you know what? This guy, Jesus of Nazareth, completely made up. Yeah, not real. Total, totally fictitious figure, never existed. There's no way the devil can say that if you're half educated. Like if you just do a little bit of your due diligence on this man named Jesus of Nazareth, there's no way the devil can make you think he's, he's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. He was a fictitious figure. L let's think about this. It is the year 2024. Why is it at the year 2024? The year 2024 of our Lord. It's because all of the planet holds time by this Middle Eastern carpenter named Jesus of Nazareth. You don't get all of time held in, keeping count by when you lived and not live. Like it doesn't work that way. So if you're half educated, there's no way the enemy can come up to you and say, yeah, he's completely made up. So here's what the enemy will do. He knows you're too smart for that. So here's what he'll do. He says, yeah, yeah, he was a real guy. Like he really lived, but he wasn't God. Like he was a real dude, but he wasn't actually God. Christians over thousands of years have made him out to be a God. This is what, this is what I see happening all the time. Get online. I see it happening all the time, trying to undermine the authority of scripture. And here's, I've even heard them say this. I've had them up in my comment section saying this, saying this, 
The Bible never claims Jesus is God. Like people have commented that to me. People make videos and guess what? They get shared because nobody fact checks them because the people they're, they're intended for don't even own a Bible. <laughs> the Bible doesn't claim Jesus is God. To those people, I would say you must have whole chapters of your Bible missing. Like, like John chapter one, let's start at verse one. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I'll continue. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. You got all 18 of those verses ripped out your Bible. If you think the Bible does not say that Jesus is God, you've got John 17, Jesus' longest recorded prayer ripped out your Bible. You got Colossians chapter one and verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. You've got that ripped out your Bible. The Bible doesn't claim Jesus is God. Read it. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll find out you're wrong. So here's what the enemy will do. If he can't get you to believe, to not believe the Bible doesn't claim Jesus is God, here's where he'll go next. And this is where I want to camp out for the remaining moments I have to preach. He'll say this, okay, maybe he claimed it, but did he prove it? Okay, maybe the Bible claims Jesus is God, but does it prove it? Did Jesus prove his divinity? And listen to me, over the next couple of moments I have left to share with you, I would like to leave you with three unique evidences. I was gonna come with four, but on, I'm gonna call an audible right now and just give you three. I think three will suffice for tonight. Three unique different evidences for why, listen to me, I believe Jesus is God incarnate. Some of you are wondering, I showed up to church on a Wednesday night to have a sermon preached to me, convincing me Jesus is God. Listen to me, you don't realize how much this stuff is actually after you. You live in Dallas, Texas, look around, and I'm not trying to throw stones, but have you seen the amount of pastors falling? If the head falls, where's the body? If the, if the head don't know theology, it can't work their way out of a theological paper bag and has found themselves in compromise because we have left the core tenets of our faith. Where might the everyday parishioner be? Listen, this stuff is after us. We gotta get back to sound doctrine is what I'm saying. We gotta know why we actually believe this stuff in the first place. And tonight I came here on a mission, listen to me, to defend the deity of Christ. The first evidence I wanna leave you with is this, no doubt, the miracles of Jesus. Jesus' is miracles. Now, if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will stumble over the fact that Jesus does some miracles. Like you cannot ignore, Jesus has miracle working power in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it's not just because we see him working a few miracles in the, in the Gospels that we claim that he's God. No, listen to me, Jesus isn't doing random miracles. Jesus in the gospels is doing the exact miracles the Old Testament said he would do. These are not random miracles, 
these are exact verbatim miracles the Old Testament prophesied the Messiah would do. You don't believe me? Go and read Isaiah 35. Go and read Isaiah 35 and you're off time. That's just one place. You will find a list of miracles. Then you will go through the gospels and find a conglomerate of miracles that fit the list you read in Isaiah 35 that Jesus does. Jesus does the miracles the Old Testament says he would do. But listen to me, that's not the only thing about Jesus's miracles that gets me. Get this, get this. Jesus did his greatest miracles right underneath the nose of his greatest skeptics. Woo. You know what I would have done? Had I been Jesus, if I wanted to work a miracle, I'd have let no skeptic come close. I would have said, hey, Bartholomew, you know the disciple who never makes it into the Bible. Come here, okay, let me give you some air time. Hey, Bartholomew, somehow he never makes it into any stories. Hey, go find my most gullible, like the dumbest followers that already believe in me, okay? We're gonna do a private meet and greet for them. I'm gonna do the whole pull my thumb off trick. <laughs> we'll send them into the streets and they'll tell everybody, he's a miracle worker. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's how I would have started my miracle tour, okay? Luckily, I am not Jesus. Jesus didn't have Keenan Clark's approach. Jesus, in essence, says this. He says, where is the most brilliant but skeptical mind in the room? Bring him close. I'll do a miracle right in front of his face. I want him to see no smoke, no mirrors, no secret string. This is real. And listen to me. Here's my challenge to you. Go throughout the Gospels and find me one time any of Jesus' skeptics questioned the legitimacy of the miracle they saw him do. I'll save you some time. You won't find it. There is not one, there's no, there's no place where Jesus does a miracle and Jesus is like, your hand was withered and now it's not. And the Pharisees go, it still looks withered to me. <laughs> they never contest the miracle. You know what they have to do? They go, yeah, you healed him, but on the Sabbath, <laughs> that, that's what they do. They can't poke a hole in the miracle, so they poke a hole in what day he did it. They say, oh, well, you, well, you did it on the Sabbath. Notice this, his, his, the critique of him confesses he did it. You did it on the Sabbath. Even Jesus' critics are tell, give, verifying his miracle working power. Here, get this. You know, one time they got so desperate, they one time said this. Jesus' critics said this. You know how he's able to cast out the devil? He does it by the power of the devil. That's what they said. And Jesus looks at him and he says, guys, let's think about this. <laughs> if Satan is casting out Satan by the power of Satan, then Satan's house is divided against itself and a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus is saying, yo jokers, your logic isn't logicking. That's what he's saying. This makes no sense. Beelzebub cannot cast out Beelzebub by the power of Beelzebub. They get so ridiculous, they resort to childlike tactics because Jesus' miracle working power was so airtight. And listen to me today, I've got good news. The, my favorite thing is not just the miracles we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but my favorite thing are the miracles in this room that if you begin to take a survey of your row, you will find he is still at work today. Jesus has miracle working power right now. His miracles are an evidence to me. The second evidence I'd like to leave you with, and this one is profound to me, and I hinted at it a moment ago, but it's Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I told you, Jesus fulfilled some things the Old Testament said, but let me kind of break this down for you. There's the New Testament, then there's the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is written by a bunch of different guys who lived over thousands of years and never met each other. Like that's the thing you tend to forget. Very few of their lifespans actually overlap. Like very few of them would have ever met face to face. Only a couple of, of them that lived in the Babylonian exile would have actually known one another but there are very few of them. They never could have conspired about what they wrote. It's almost like they had the same Holy Spirit 
in their ear. And here's the thing, over all those books written by a bunch of different guys over a long period of time are peppered in prophecies about one man. And one man, listen to me, one dude has to fit the criteria found amongst all those prophets. And Jesus did it. Now, this intelligent skeptic in the room could say, okay, Kenan, maybe Jesus fulfilled some prophecy. You got to give them an accent. It makes them sound pretentious, right? <laughs> okay, Kenan, maybe Jesus fulfilled some prophecy. But I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's lots of guys who quote unquote fulfilled the prophecies. Like these, pro- these prophecies are probably easy to fulfill. I'm sure there's lots of guys who fit the bill, but Jesus is just the most famous. So that's why we attribute this feat to him. I'm sure there's lots of dudes who could be equally eligible for this title. Oh, contraire. Greater minds than you and I have wondered the same thing. And listen to me, they did the math. There was a man by the name of Peter Stoner. He lived in the 19, he died, I should say, in the 1980s. And before he died, he wrote a book called Science Speaks. The information I'm gonna share with you in the next couple moments comes from that literature, Science Speaks. Peter Stoner was a devout believer, but he was also a professor of mathematics and science. And Peter Stoner began to read the Old Testament and see that Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies he was finding as he was going through the Old Testament. And his mathematical mind began to wonder, I wonder what the probability is that one man could fulfill any given number of Old Testament prophecy. So Peter Stoner got together a, a 600 undergrad and graduate level students together. And he says, guys, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run the numbers on what the probability is that one man could fulfill any given number of these prophecies. And he tells the students, we're gonna start low. Let's start with just eight prophecies. What's the math on one man fulfilling eight of them? And they run the numbers and the numbers blow their minds. The numbers come back that for one man to fulfill eight of the prophecies, it is one in 100 million billion. Long odds. Those of you who have been out of school for a minute, long odds. One in 100 million billion. Listen to me. The equivalent of this would be as if I took a one inch square piece of tile. And I was to say, hey, you know, I got a lot of these, these tiles. Um, I feel out of the benevolence of my heart, I feel led of the spirit to donate some tile. And we're gonna tile this entire auditorium. In fact, we're gonna do the, the new expansion too. I'll tile that too while I'm at it, okay? Feel real good tonight. We're gonna tile the whole thing in one inch square pieces of tile. So we tile the whole facility in one inch square pieces of tile. We get done and we're like, oh, dang, we still uh, got some tile left. And I go, okay, let's tile all of rock wall in one inch square pieces of tile. So we get done with rock wall and I still have some tile and we're like, okay, let's tile all of Texas in one inch square pieces of tile. And then I still have more tile. So I'm like, okay, let's think big here. All of North America. We're gonna tile all of North America, okay? We're gonna make America tile again, okay? Like, <laughs> come on, let's get behind this endeavor, okay? <laughs> One square inch at a time. We tile all of North America in one inch square pieces of tile. Then we tile South America. Then we tile Europe. Then we tile Asia. Then we tile Africa. Then we tile Australia. Then we go to Walmart, buy a parka, because it's gonna be really cold when we go and tile Antarctica. You literally tile every piece of land on earth in one inch square pieces of tile. And the secret is this, on the back of one of them, I put a gold star. And then I come and find Pastor Nick. I say, Pastor Nick, I know you just met me, but like, I got a project that's got your name on it. I have, sur- I have covered the whole earth in one inch square pieces of tile. I need you to survey the whole thing and I'll fund it. I'll get you as many planes as you need. I'll get you as many Ubers as you need, but I need you to survey the whole earth. But here's the kicker. You can only bend down pick up and turn over one tile and it better be the one I put a gold star on the bottom of. This right here is the mathematical probability that one man can fulfill eight Old Testament prophecies, long odds.
So obviously Peter Stoner's like pretty stoked, right? So he goes, okay guys, let, let's, let's keep studying this. Let's jump the number a little bit. Let's not just think eight, let's try 48. What's the math on one man fulfilling 48? And the math comes back that for one man to fulfill 48 Old Testament prophecies, it is one in one trillion, 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 trillion. You literally have to say the word trillion 13 times. One in one trillion to the power of 13. Again, long odds. The equivalent of this would be as if I took a pair of tweezers and I pulled down one atom. And I took a pair, I took a, a, a can of spray paint and I spray painted that one atom gold. And then I took that one gold atom and I put it into a space, the equivalent to one trillion, 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 billion times the size of our known universe. Then I come behind Pastor Nick again. I say, hey, you thought the last one was fun. I have a weird favor with a man by the name of Elon Musk. And he's loaned me a rocket. He's loaned me a rocket. I need Pastor Nick, with your no rocket experience, to hop up in Mr. Elon Musk's rocket. And I need you to survey this space that is one trillion, 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 billion times the size of our known universe. But here's the kicker. You can only open your porthole one time and use your tweezers to pull in one atom and it better be the one I spray painted gold. This is the math on one man fulfilling 48 Old Testament prophecies. I got good news tonight. Jesus didn't fulfill 48. Do you know how many Old Testament prophecies Jesus fulfilled? Over 300. The actual number is 324 to be exact. Jesus fulfilled 324 Old Testament prophecies. Listen to me. I cannot imagine an illustration where I conjure up a space large enough and create matter small enough to send Pastor Nick exploring to equate to what Jesus actually did. Like that is, it's, it's literally unimaginable to do it justice. But listen to me, though it is mathematically unimaginable, it is spiritually true. And there are people under the sound of my breath tonight who can say, he did it, and he did it for me. Listen, I can, I'm here to remind you, you're the reason every prophecy had to be fulfilled. Because if he didn't perfectly do it, he could not pull you out of your imperfection. He couldn't pull you out of the, your sin. He wouldn't be a perfect sacrifice. He wouldn't fit the bill. So every time he crossed a T, every time he dotted an I, every time he yielded to the Father, he was thinking about you. Every single prophecy was because your life hung in the balance. And yet you still think he doesn't have a plan for you. Yet you still think he's eager to discard you. As if he would do all that to get you in the door, but then he would barely let you stay. I call that heresy. It is a heresy to believe that God will go through all those links to get you saved, but then be so unbenevolent and unmerciful that he'd be eager to toss you back out to the hell he saved you from. It's a heresy. Listen to me, he really was born of a virgin. He really was born in a town called Bethlehem. He really did come riding in on a donkey. He really was betrayed by a close friend. He really was sold for 30 pieces of silver. He really did die between two criminals. And listen to me, he really did die having his hands and feet pierced. You know, it's crazy when that last prophecy I just said came forward, with that the Messiah would die with their hands and their feet pierced. When that came forward, crucifixion hadn't been invented. No one had ever seen anyone die by crucifixion. But King David in Psalm 22 writes down, they pierce my hands and my feet. You know what Psalm 22 is called? It's called the Messianic Psalm because it is a depiction of the kind of death the Messiah would die at the hands of men. Jesus fulfilled prophecy. And here's where I land the plane. I promise I'm done. I've preached long enough. Sorry, I get excited. The last evidence to me has to be Jesus' bodily resurrection. His physical resurrection. I'm not talking about a metaphorical resurrection. I'm not talking about a psychological resurrection. I am talking about a physical resurrection. This is not a metaphor. It truly happened. 
like life came back into his body. It's not a state of consciousness. It's not a state of mind. It's real. There is a physical man in Jesus in heaven right now. He never discarded his physical body. When he ascended to the Father, he kept his physical form. He's been glorified, but he is seated at the right hand of God. And you know what my Bible says he's doing right now? Seated at the right hand of the Father, he is making intercession for you. That's Bible terminology for he's praying for you that every time you begin to doubt, every time a little fox begins to wander in and you begin to tolerate it, Jesus begins to pull you back with an invisible string called prayer and say, I've got more for you. Don't you dare succumb to that little fox. Remember what I did for you. I'm talking about his physical resurrection tonight. And listen to me, I have heard the resurrection preached in every which way, and I'm sure men of God have preached it the same way I'm going to, but I have never heard it in all my years of sitting in church. I've heard every passage you could hear. Preachers preach the resurrection, except the one that's the most powerful to me. Because get this, Matthew 28 tells us that it wasn't just a couple of girls who testified Jesus was resurrected. And it wasn't just Peter, James, and John who testified Jesus was resurrected. Matthew 28 says that two Roman guards testified, pagan guards, who were assigned at the foot of the tomb of Jesus, testified that he resurrected from the dead. It says this, that these two Roman guards, go and fact check me, were put in front of the tomb and under pain of death, told you don't let anyone tamper with this tomb. And all of a sudden on the morning of the third day, your Bible says an angel began to descend and he rolls the stone away. And upon rolling the stone away, he then sits on the stone and out comes a resurrected Christ. And the two Roman guards, listen, these weren't Barney Fife guards. These were guys who were trained, armed, dangerous men. And upon seeing Christ walk out the tomb, they fall on the ground and pretend to be dead. And then when Jesus walks off, those two guards get up and they run straight to Caiaphas, the high priest. And they go, K -K 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 Caiaphas, he, 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 he did it. Like he really did it. Like the thing you said he wasn't gonna do, he pulled it off we saw him resurrect. And Matthew 28 says this, those religious leaders look back at these two Roman guards and they say, you better never tell that story ever again. And they said, we'll pay you a lot of money to tell this story. You fell asleep. And upon falling asleep, his disciples came and they stole his body. And listen, if your superiors get mad that you fell asleep, we'll pay them off too. And get this, Matthew, this is decades after this has happened. Matthew is pinning all of this in Matthew 28. Matthew says this in Matthew 28, and this story is still being told to this day. That that's what he says. It's still being told to this day. The lie had to be perpetuated. You know why? Because the truth of the resurrection decades later was still spreading like wildfire. The only reason you gotta keep a lie alive is because the truth refuses to die. Whoo! And as if that wasn't enough, listen to me, listen to me. This is the first Wednesday, just g give me a little grace. I'm so sorry, I'm going a little long. But as if that wasn't enough, you know what we have? We have nine documents, nine. Some found within the pages of scripture and some extra biblical documents, non-biblical documents that never made it into the canon. We have nine of them that testify, listen to me, that testify about Jesus's disciples' conviction concerning their eyewitness account of his bodily resurrection the conviction they had about it. Listen to me, I grew up in church all my life and I knew Jesus' disciples died, but I did not know why they died. I thought I did. I always thought they died because they believed in Jesus. It's not why they died. Do you know why each disciple was martyred by Rome? It's because Rome came, go study church history. It's because Rome would come to each one of them and say, we don't care about you quietly believing in Jesus in your heart and talking and reminiscing about some times you had with him and trying to live a better life. We don't care about any of that. Do that in peace. What we care about is this message about his resurrection. Go read church history. It wasn't a quiet belief in their heart that got them in trouble. It was their witness of his resurrection. They kept talking. He's alive. He rose again. They killed him, but he didn't stay dead. And Rome, listen to me. 
And Rome told them, if you'll shut up about his resurrection, we'll let you live. If you'll quit telling people you saw him alive again, we'll let you walk out of here. And it wasn't just one disciple who refused to can't recant their eyewitness account. Every single one of them was willing to be martyred for their faith in, his, in their eyewitness account of his resurrection. Study psychology, modern psychology will tell you that it is impossible for the human psyche to die for what they know is a lie. That's a secular psychological study. A human being cannot die for a lie when they know the truth. When telling the truth will let you live, you will not die for what you know is a lie. And every single disciple, when told, if you say the resurrection's fake, we'll let you walk out of here. They said, I guess you're gonna have to crucify me. I guess you're gonna have to impale me. I guess you're gonna have to hang me. I guess you're gonna have to fillet me. I guess you're gonna have to cut me in half because I will not recant my eyewitness account of his resurrected body. Listen to me, I'll read it to you. Church history records this, that Peter was crucified on an upside down cross when told if he would recant the resurrection, they would let him live. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. And get this, church history says that as Andrew is hanging on an X-shaped cross, taking hours to die, you know what he used those hours to do? He preached the resurrection. <laughs> when dying for the resurrection, he says, I guess I got one more time to tell this story, boys. He really did it. He got up out that grave. He's alive and well today. And you pagan sinners can find grace if you'll just call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. If you'll call on his name, he'll save you too. Listen to me, James was beheaded. Philip was crucified. Thomas was filleted and then beheaded. Or excuse me, Bartholomew was filleted and then beheaded. Get this, did this Thomas? Thomas died by a spear wound. You know why that's so pertinent to me? Because I read the Bible. Thomas is the one who doubted the resurrection. He said, I won't believe Jesus has been resurrected unless I can stick my finger in his nail wound and unless I can stick my hand to where a spear went into his side. And your Bible says Jesus shows up to a little fox eaten up doubting Thomas. And Jesus says, Thomas, stick out your hand. Put your finger where the nail went through my hand. Take your whole hand and stick it to where the spear went into my side. And then Jesus says this to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And you know what, con you know what convinces me that that actually happened to Thomas? Later on, Thomas was willing to take a spear himself versus recant the resurrection. He once doubted. I'm telling you he's real. I'm telling you on the other side of going all in and stop, and stop tolerating little foxes, there is a zeal, there is a boldness, there is a confidence that nothing in this world could give you the likeness of. I'm not done. Thomas was killed with a spear. Matthew was staked and speared to the ground. Jude was killed with an ax. Simon the Zealot was cut in half with a saw. James, the son of Alphaeus, was stoned. And John is the only disciple to not die by martyrdom. But it wasn't because Rome didn't try. They tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't die. So they stuck him on an island called Patmos. And you know what he did on that island called Patmos? He writes a book called Revelation. Where, we, oh my God, we all think Revelation's just about the end times. That's not what John says in, in Revelation chapter one, verse one. He says, this is the revelation, not of the end times. He says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but if I just survived a boiling vat of oil for a guy who never resurrected, I wouldn't care to write down his revelation. Unless he actually did what I claim he did. In Revelation, we see that in the last days, Jesus will walk among the seven lampstands of the church. He'll call people back to their first love, that his eyes will burn with fire, his hair is white, his wool, his feet are of burnished bronze. This is where we find these descriptors of Jesus Christ. And tonight, listen to me, I did not fly all the way here from Franklin, Tennessee to just call you to some apathetic life of quietly believing in Jesus. No, no, no. Listen to me, discern the times, watch and pray. 
It is so prophetic that he is highlighting that Israel is at the beginning of a new year. My wife and I this week have been praying for the peace of Israel. Do you not feel provoked? Do you not feel stirred up? Like the times we're living in are strange, but what an honor it is. And listen to me, if God allows you to live through strange times, He is prepared to endow you with a strange oil. God wants to put a strange oil on you tonight. Something that separates the wheat from the chaff, something that separates the, the sheep from the goats. And it's time that the church of Jesus Christ stops tolerating little foxes and steps into everything that she's been called to be. And right now, with every head up, eye open, and everyone looking around, if you would say, Kenan, I need a fresh oil on this first Wednesday. I need a fresh, I, I want what Peter had. I want what Thomas had. I want a revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to slaughter a few little foxes tonight. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now and I want to pray for you. If your hand is lifted, would you stand to your feet right now, right where you're at, just stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you all across this building. And we're going to go into a moment of worship. Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice who is saying yes to you who is getting on their feet saying God I'll go the distance God if you'll put a strange oil on me I'll stand up in strange times we're a peculiar people and it's how we endure suffering it's how we stand when no one else will stand it's how we shout when no one else will shout I thank you right now that you would baptize them in fresh oil right now, God, right now for the times and day and age we live in, that we are more anointed for our day than anyone else would be because we are here ordained by God. No one sneaks into the earth. God speaks you into the earth. And I pray, God, that a fresh oil, a fresh vigor, a fresh discernment would come over your people right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's just begin to worship. Let's just begin to worship. Let's go.